I'm here with Lachlan Giles discussing his preparation for ADCC 2019. In the last video we discussed some basic planning theory and how Lockie broke down 2019 to three key periods. The first one was before Grapple Fest 4, the second in the run up to the ADCC trials and the final in the run up to the ADCC World Championships themselves. We then discussed how Lockie divided each period up into two macro cycles, with the first focused on skill development and the second on preparing for competition. Now we're going to jump right back into the discussion and address how Lockie set specific goals on a month-to-month -month and week-to-week -week basis for his ADCC competition preparation macro cycle. Interestingly for us, actually, um, the UFC in 2018, I don't know if you've seen this, they published a guide from the UFC Performance Institute where they basically created a methodology for, for MMA to put out there to give us kind of general advice to people competing in MMA. And because MMA is very close, in my opinion, to to jiu-jitsu it's jiu-jitsu is one of the key components of, of mma it's kind of something that's quite nice to look at and we can we can use their platform as a as a basis for our discussion and actually if, if people haven't read that book i'd go and recommend you read it and the reason i recommend you read that book it's freely available online is because the guy that's the vice president of performance uh for the ufc is a guy called duncan french and, and duncan was from the uk uh he previously worked at the english institute of sport where he's the technical lead from 2012 to 2016 uh, rio olympic games and he serviced a number of different sports, cycling, taekwondo, uh, power swimming, squash, and netball. As an SNC coach, that's his background. And if you read that UFC book, you'll see they're specifically using the terminology discussed here. They, they use what it takes to win. They use something called critical determinants of performance, which is uh, like those benchmarks that you can benchmark yourself against compared to other people. And essentially, this book was him essentially putting together the British strategy that they use for the Olympics for the UFC. So they have some of these basic benchmarks. They can say to you, OK, you're compared to the people that are winning the UFC championship, your aerobic conditioning is here or your strength levels are here. It's more from a physical perspective, because, of course, yeah. the UFC Performance Institute is more focused on physical stuff and, and mental stuff, not on the, the, the technical side of things. But they've tried to use this strategy. So it's quite a nice book to look at. And in there, they, they describe periodization uh, structure that they use that we can look at here and so they use the same thing that i talked about but because it's the ufc there's two things that happen one is that you get told okay you've got a fight and it's in three months time and then other times you finished your fight and you don't have a, a fight coming up so they divide it into two phases two, or two macro cycles they have off camp where you, you don't know there's a fight happening so you're basically training and then they have fight camp which is when you know the date of the fight is going to happen and when you're in the off camps phase, they, again, they use this general and specific preparation and they suggest you cycle between periods of general preparation, and specific preparation, exactly like you said, so you don't lose like your feeling. And they have like a whole list of technical, physical fueling for uh, performance, nutrition and resilience. And they talk about the, the things that you should probably work on each of these phases. And then they have the fight camp. And what they do is they talk through the fight camp in terms, they break it down to three phases. The first phase is what they call early camp. The second phase is what they call late camp and the third phase is what they call competition. And again, they have different goals for each of those, each of those different phases. And so if I was to take kind of what you're describing and put it into the same, into the same framework, we can, you know, we can then break it down and we can talk about how you would divide it up from an early camp for the, for the first part of your ADCC camp. Maybe what you did a little bit later on, maybe two or three weeks before the competition and then, and then what you did in, in the preparation for the competition. And, Maybe in the future we can get involved, talk a bit more around how the UFC, uh, you know, what their general guidelines are. But the idea is that this is what they're recommending, and so I've tried to take some of their concepts as a baseline and, and put them into uh, into our into our discussion here. So, as I said, the golden rule of planning is that you start backwards. So, let's just say the last week of your ADCC competition, ADCC I think was a Saturday and Sunday. When is it that you actually flew to the US to to start competing? Yeah, this was a this is a tricky one because being from Australia, whenever you go overseas, you have to that there's going to be jet lag, um, which means you you know it's it's not like a very short flight interstate. It's it's going to be a, a usually at least a twelve to fourteen hour flight, which I think I think to to Los Angeles is about about fourteen fifteen hours, and then when you add in travel time to and from airports, it ends up being a, you know, around a 20 hour process to just to get there. Um, and it's that it, it definitely takes its toll on you, like on your, uh, how you're feeling. <laughs> but there's the other part, which I, I always like to do my training with my, my own team. 
I, when I, when I roll with my teammate, especially before, like one of the biggest considerations in that last week is to not get injured. Um, but also to have that intensity. Cause if you just kind of flow roll and then you go and try and compete in ADCC, I feel like that's hard too. So I still want to have intensity, but with training partners that I know they're kind of a little more predictable in what movements they're going to do. So I can kind of prepare for them. And they, I know they're going to look after me. Uh, whereas when I go overseas, as much as I would expect people to, to train nicely with me, you don't really know. Some people go, oh, you know, I've got a chance to tap someone who's about to fight in ADCC. They might go really hard. They might go too light, not wanting to, to injure me. So training with people I, I trust, I think is really important. So I actually, I put that ahead of the jet lag, you know, cause I didn't want to have a full week without training or have to train with people I didn't know in that week. So I think I trained up until the Wednesday morning and then flew on the Wednesday. So I would have arrived, um, or maybe it was till Tuesday morning and, and flew on Wednesday morning. I think I it, usually you leave on the Wednesday and arrive on Wednesday because of the time change. But so that gave me a, just a few days to actually um, in the, in the U S to, um, to kind of get over the jet lag, <laughs> which I certainly didn't, but um, that's, that was, that was the, the cost of doing that, I guess. I mean, I, in an ideal world, you could fly your whole training camp over and you, and they train with you, but jujitsu doesn't have that sort of money. So. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely two strategies there. We spend a lot of time on, uh, on this in, in Olympic sports and like have experts that can help us out. You need one day for every hour of time zone change. So if you've got 12 hours, then really you need to be there 12 days beforehand, or you can go in last minute and then you don't, and then you don't have to, but going in three days before was that, was there any it's probably strategy? the worst? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It probably was the worst <laughs> you think you could have done, but, but at the yeah. same time, as you said, there's this other conflicting thing, which is, you know, you don't want to get injured, which is probably more important than being slightly, slightly jet lagged. Um, but did you do any like time zone change in Australia before you, before you moved across? No, that you? was the, probably something I, that's probably something I should have done. Um, I, I don't know, maybe I, obviously there's, there's some research I should, I should look up into that, but I always felt that the biggest thing was just the, like being on the plane and not being able to sleep at, like even if I had adjusted to the time zone, if I went on the plane, and then suddenly I'm not able to sleep. It would kind of mess me around anyway, but, but I'm sure there's, there's probably some good strategies to, to get around that. And just to let you know how it affected, like I think I woke up the morning of that open weight. I think I went to bed at about midnight and woke up at 1am. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then I think I, you know, I was up from one till five and then maybe, fell asleep again from like five till eight or something, but it was, a, it was a terrible, like I, I was actually feeling a bit sick as well. That the day I had my best performance was probably the, had all the, the excuses. Um, so it just kind of shows you that excuses you shouldn't really use, you know, cause I was, I was starting to get cold and I thought, um, and, um, yeah, terrible sleep. And, but then I just, I had my best performance. So, yeah, of course. I mean, like the, the the whole idea about preparation is preparation doesn't guarantee you success, right? What yeah. it does is it shifts the the probability yeah. in, in your favor. That's the idea, right? So you can do all the preparation in the world and you can still go out in the first round or you can do all the preparation in the world and everything goes perfectly and you win and everything's great, isn't it? It's just about, it's just about trying to shift everything, the balance in your favor. Yeah, and that's what yeah we're obviously, doing. obviously my chances, you know, when you're feeling like that should be less. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's something we could actually talk about at another point of actually in Aspire. We're lucky enough to have one of the guys, one of the top guys in the world on this area. So maybe I could get him on. He could give you some advice on what maybe you should do next time to give yourself a better chance, <laughs> but uh, something for a another time. But so I think there what you've done is you described two things, right? One is that um, you described the fact about the, the travel and that was the, co the bit the UFC talked about, their competition the competition part. And the second thing was their late phase. And in their camp, they, in their doc document, they specifically talk about late phase and the fact that the late camp is all about making sure, as you said, that you don't get injured and also focus on cutting weight. If you need to cut weight, did you have to cut any weight for uh, ADCC or was that not really a consideration necessarily a bigger consideration for you? Not a, not a large amount of weight. So as in like no, nothing on the day really, but yeah, uh, I, I walk around, you know, 78, 79 kilos and it's, and it's a 77 kilo division. I actually, I think I wanted, I tried to eat a lot. Um, and even 
there was like a week where I started doing weights before I remembered I hated it. Um, where I thought about getting up to like trying to get up to 83 kilos. So then I could, um, cut down and be, you know, a, a, an enormous, um, competitor like probably like everyone else is in the, in the division so it's probably not actually enormous it's just a level a level uh, size um but yeah I, at the same time there's tr- you know there's training volume I, I just you know when i'm when i'm trying to do a lot of wrestling and um I, I my experience has been trying to add strength and conditioning on top of the skill acquisition i'm trying to do uh it just adds too much volume and i, I end up um paying for it with nothing is no serious injuries thankfully yet from from trying to do that but yeah mild enough but enough to make me realize that i'd just rather train jiu-jitsu yeah well i guess that's one thing it's like in some ways you could say that a disadvantage the fact you're probably one of the the lighter guys in your category you know in terms of you're walking around weight versus what you fight at but at the same time it allows you just to train however you want and you don't have to worry about making weight and i think the reason the ufc put this like a late phase section in their in their in their plan is one is in, in Olympic sports, you have something called a taper, right? Which is where you get into what they call peak form and, you know, you reduce your volume and you're supposed to feel good. But another key part of the taper is always to make sure that it's important to turn up at a competition uninjured. You know, that's probably the most likely thing that's going to cause you not mm. to perform your best. And the fact that you, you know, you were thinking about that is exactly what the UFC is suggesting because they've had lots of fights called off because people haven't done that late phase properly. So that's probably why they're, they emphasize that in their, in their plan. And and I think between the jet lag and the uh, and if you jet lag and cutting weight at the same time would be a really difficult thing for you to for you to do uh, and still be ready and and feeling good for that for that competition. Yeah, the other thing is the the weigh in is in the morning of the competition, so you can you can like you could rehydrate. Maybe you could put two three kilogram. You know, you could maybe go from seventy seven to eighty kilograms if you really had cut weight, but. I mean, I imagine you're going to, if, you're, if you've done that, you probably might not be feeling that good for your performance either. So I think for me, just, you know, the week, you know, the, the, from 79 to 77 is for me is really just eating a little bit less, maybe very mild dehydration, if, if any, but, um, you know, it's, it's more, you know, why, why, I usually a day or two before the, the event, I'll kind of be very close to 77 and I just make sure I don't, eat or drink enough to make me go over it from there and that's that's usually enough i'm not feeling bad i, I feel fine so and do you have to weigh in the second day as well yes if you make it through the so first you can't, day yeah you have to weigh in both days so you can't i know i've known some people you know i've seen some people cutting a large amount of weight for adcc to make weight and then having to do it again for the semi-final and final but it's you know if maybe that's made the difference for them so yeah, yeah definitely i mean it's definitely a strategy that people should consider it's just also a high risk and and difficult thing to pull off but i guess that's where practice and repeatedly doing that would be would be important so we've talked about the competition now let's talk a bit about the the eight weeks you know the eight weeks that you went through did anything change throughout those eight weeks of doing your more competition preparation or was it basically the same thing all the way through the eight weeks over the eight weeks oh probably the last two weeks there's a the last two weeks I have to be very where probably the last 10 days in particular, I'd say wary of even minor injuries. I think you can get a minor injury, uh, you know, four weeks out and you'll be fine. You know, you, like I, my, my thoughts are if you have a sprain or a strain, which, which I'll call it, which is kind of, we'll say that's, which is actually a tear, but just to a low level, there's no, there's actually people for the people listening, there's a sprain and a strain is actually a, you know, a tear, <laughs> but just to a less degree than, you know, a severe tear, um, you know, like a, so we're talking like a, a grade one injury, for example, often if you give yourself 10 days, you can still for the most part perform, um, you know, but if you get that within the last 10 days, there's a, there's a decent chance that it'll actually impact your ability to perform how you want. So uh, you got to, I, I would just add a lot more caution to the, the move I'm about to do potentially, I, st- I still want the intensity in that last, those last 10 days. Like I'm going hard, but if I'm like, if there's a point where I'm going to have to like, you know, get taken down and post just to not get um, swept or something, which could potentially uh, be dangerous. I'll, I'd still probably avoid that, you know, while still trying to mimic the, um, the realism of a, of a match. How did you feel throughout that preparation period? Did you feel uh, through the competition period? Did you feel that each week you got better and better and better? And the reason I asked this is because 
you had that kinetic competition where you beat five guys in a row. Um, that was probably three weeks into this eight week, uh, into this eight week competition preparation uh, phase. Um, how did you feel that your performance improved throughout that period? Did you feel that you had an immediate improvement or was it a gradual improvement? When did you, you know, how good did you feel at that kinetic competition compared to how you felt at the end of that eight weeks when you went to ADCC? I felt, to be honest, I felt good throughout because I think, I mean, my, my approach as well, it was something that changed between 2017 and 2019 was the, I've actually tried to do less training and feel better when I show up to training. I, I mean, I hear, you hear of the, you know, and I've seen, I've seen some people who are doing, you know, four, six hours training a day. I, my body doesn't handle that. I don't know. Maybe there's some secret. They're not telling everyone to, to do that, but um, I've, I've never been able to do that. But anytime I tried, you know, I, I think knowing that people were doing that, I'd be trying to push like that, that, that volume. I would be trying to push my volume as much as possible, but to the point where, you know, sometimes you'd be walking up the stairs to the, to training and like walking up the stairs, you're like, Oh, the stairs, you know, like I, I'm struggling with stairs, you know, my, my legs are sore. I, I'm not like, I'm not excited to get on the mat. Well, obviously once you're training, it's different, but, and, and I, I, when I say I'm not excited, it doesn't mean I, I was disliking jujitsu or the training. I still liked the training, but the, the, it didn't feel like my body was, you know, had a lot of energy to, to be using. And then I also felt that impacted how, how I would train. Cause there's ways I know I can train in a way that maximizes my volume. You know, I can go slower and, you know, do less explosive movements or um, choose certain positions where I can kind of rest and lean on my opponent instead of be moving around. But that might not be the best type of training for, you know, like that, that's not necessarily practicing what I want to do in an ADCC competition. So I found that by, by lowering the volume, even for the skill development phase, just like, you know, lowering the volume um, and, and feeling good coming in, I felt better. And then I, th I feel like just, again, from going for in the skill development phase, like I think volume is an important factor. So I've still got the volume there. And then when I dropped that back and just did the you know half an hour of rolling, I felt probably better each day that I came in. And so I think, I don't know how much I felt I improved over the eight weeks, but I think just feeling better and feeling like I could, you know, you know, when I want to, I can try that move that, you know, that I might not, if I'm tired, just gives you a, a extra boost of confidence. My leg locks had, you know, I was filming the leg lock instructional, which might be something we were going to discuss later, but um, uh, that my leg locks felt like they had, you know, even in the last few, probably the last two, three months, you know, when I started in, in filming that instructional and um, up until that ADCC, that, that was, they felt like that improved massively. I mean, I think I remember speaking to Craig at before Kinetic and I was like, I was like, man, my, my leg locks are feeling really good at the moment. <laughs> like I'm, I was like, I want to show you some of the, the, the things I've been working. He's, obviously we, a lot, a lot of the stuff we develop, um, you know, to, together or like we work, um, we work, we've worked quite a lot together as well, but Craig had been away and I was like, Oh, I feel like I've, you know, picked up some new things. So yeah. Um, that the process of doing that was really good. So you did that kinetic competition, but that was the only one that you did during that eight week preparation phase. And, and in Olympic sports, for example, often you compete more. Is there a reason why you didn't compete more? Or is it just that you think actually it's not a good idea to compete in that last eight weeks because competition in like real competition against people that are trying to, you know, take your leg off is maybe too dangerous. What's your thoughts on that? I don't think everyone should use this, this strategy, but in some ways I felt like I had a slight difference in my game that, that people didn't really know or weren't aware that I was playing that strategy unless they'd been watching very closely, you know, the Asia trials. I, I don't think many of my opponents in that division would have really looked at, at what I was doing in the, the Asia trials um, or even potentially in, in kinetic extremely closely. Um, so um, I think if I was competing a lot that might, draw a little more attention, might've drawn a little more attention to the game. I was, I was playing at that time. Um, 
so that could have been a factor. Uh, probably probably was a, a little bit of a factor, just because I thought I had a little surprise element to to bring. Um, but also, you know, to, when you when you're in Australia, I could you know, there's local competitions and then there's international competitions, and it's a big, you know, to to you know to get like an ADCC level opponent, I'm probably going to have to fly to um, to the USA or to you know, Europe or some part of the world to have a fight, and that takes a good that, that i basically need at the very minimum a week out of my normal training schedule that i'm using to prepare um, for the tournament so i think i just I probably put that first how do you feel about the eight weeks do you think that's a, a good amount of time to prepare for a tournament like for for the i guess the competition prep phase it's interesting you chose eight weeks because uh if you look at the ufc guidelines they suggest between four and ten weeks for a camp. My first question would be, okay, there's a massive difference between four and 10 weeks, right? Which is the first question, like why do some people need four weeks, some people need 10 weeks, or why do they suggest such a big range? And I guess there's a couple of reasons. One is probably practical considerations from a UFC perspective. Some people are gonna be told four weeks before this guy's dropped out, you've got a four week camp. So there's probably that. But also the second thing that I think is really important that most people probably don't think about it is individual differences. And this is something that uh, I think is really important that we should discuss uh, closely. If you think back to what we talked about in the last chapter, I talked about like three training environments, right? The first one was an unstructured training environment. The second one was a sports specific training environment. The third one was individualized training environment. And your eight weeks meant that everyone in your team, I mean, I know it's probably really only, uh, actually how many people were were preparing for ADCC within your team? Actually, I should say, sorry. I said four, Uh, one of them was Craig. He wasn't there, so three. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then there's Kit Dales, the honorary fifth that ended up dropping out but he was um in the states as well but they had him registered as as absolute um so it was it was kind of cool to have five names down there for a moment even though that didn't didn't quite occur yeah, <laughs> yeah. but you but you had three guys preparing it basically in your gym as part of the as part of the preparation yeah. uh live live myself and ben hodgkinson um yeah so this is where something it could be kind of an interesting uh an interesting thing to discuss then so in an unstructured environment, just everyone's, you're not really thinking about what you're doing, but you can still get results, right? In the sports specific uh, structure, you had what you had, where you had like an eight week training block, you know, you're going to do this and it's, it, it makes sense, right? It, it makes sense in your mind. But then there's the third level, which is the one that everyone in elite performance sports now trying to exploit. And that's the individualization of training. And if you're going to individualize training, then the question is, is that eight week preparation period, the right time for you versus live versus the, the, the last guy? Like, mm. is that the right thing? Right. And, and look, uh, this last phase is very, very hard to do. Individualization is extremely difficult. I'm not saying it's something that's easily implemented, but let's just talk a little bit about that. And if you want to implement an individualized approach, then you need to understand that people don't respond in terms of weeks, right? So week, a time frame is just something that we make up as human beings really what our body responds to is training. And the easiest thing to talk about that when we talk about it is like a training session and how training sessions drive sports form, what we call sports form. So the way to explain sports form is sports form is a combination of everything that you put together, right? So um, you're looking at how your sports form changes over time. So sports form is everything. It's your technical, your tactics, it's your physical, mental side. Um, It's your nutritional status. Okay, is how all these things come together to, to give you the outcome that you want, right? Just how, how good you're going to perform. Is that, so sports form is basically performance almost? Like yes. how you perform? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, how you, it's how you perform. Again, we're using this terminology originally taken from the USSR, but it, it, that is a, you know, sports form incorporates everything because people could say their, their performance in terms of like how strong they get in the gym or their performance in terms of, you know, technically how good they're getting. But the sports form encompasses everything. It's how everything integrates mm-hmm. together, right? And what you're trying to do is if you want to be individualized about training, you want to try and track this because this is an important factor. And in fact, in sports where we have tracked this very closely, there's actually some very interesting things that we can learn from it. And so the idea is you track sports form over a period of time, right? And what you'll see is if you're able to do this, is you'll see that there's usually most people, uh, if they don't change their training too often, if they're not doing random stuff, if it's being relatively well-structured, their sports form will improve across time, which is what, what you would expect, right? You would expect you get better over time, especially when you're going from your skill development into your competition preparation. And if there's a way of tracking this, you can see your sports form might go up, it might go down a bit, it might go back up again, it might drop off if you, over a period of time. And the idea is, of course, to have it at the point where you're really feeling good is the time when you want to compete. Where ADCC Worlds is, that's where you want to have the highest 
level of sports form. You don't want to have achieve that three weeks before or 10 weeks after or whatever. You want to have it happening around about the period when you're, you're going to compete. How are you measuring sports form, Tom? This is actually the, the, really, the really difficult bit. But you know, what I would do is I'd turn around and say to you, I would ask you the same question. So you said that you started to feel really good. Like when you went to Kinetic, you felt really good. Like how is it that you knew that you were good? Like what is it that made you felt like you were in good shape? How did you determine that? I think it is hard in, um, <laughs> in jiu-jitsu to, to measure that, I think. Um, I mean, I, for me, I was, you know, uh, if we talk about leg locks in, in particular, like I just felt like, you know, I was p- people that I might get tapped a few times in a round, I was tapping a lot more. And uh, it was to the point where a lot of people in the gym were trying to figure out counters. You know, they were, they were getting frustrated that my entries and my finishes were working and they were trying to figure out counters. And anytime they would come up with something, it would be quite quick to for me to kind of have an answer to that and to keep keep pressuring that that system i guess that i was using so i just felt like everything was really coming to together with that um and and wrestling wrestling's probably uh, harder but it, it is i think I, I don't know what you think but um jiu-jitsu is a hard one to measure performance it's, i think you could you could choose like a someone you're rolling with and and sort of gauge you know whether you you know, if you normally lose to them in a certain way, is that stopping or, you know, you're now beating them or have you got your, your particular technique to work? But um, yeah, I think on an individual level, but in a broad scope in terms of rolling against a bunch of people, I think it's much harder to measure in from a objective point of view anyway. I think it's, it's somewhat subjective. Yeah, and I think this is the thing, right? So there are some sports that we'll talk about in a few minutes that like it's very easy to measure this, but jiu-jitsu would be a difficult one to do that. But I think if... And this is the, one of the questions from the debate is how would we come up with a way of measuring sports form would be one of the very first things I would ask if I was working professionally in jiu-jitsu. And I think there are ways of doing it that you kind of talked about there. For example, if we were video analyzing your, your competition, you know, your training, for example, we could look at the number of points you would score or, or key actions and how are you achieving those against what level of opponent. And we could build some kind of a metric that we could use that. Or we could just do a very simple thing, which is we could rate on a scale of one to 10 or one to seven or however you want to do it how you're feeling and how you felt you did in that session. So you could measure sports form in jujitsu in, in a, if you had scientists and stuff around, you could measure it kind of relatively objectively, or you could measure it more in a, like an RP or, you know, a, a feeling perspective. Um, but in sports where you can actually measure exactly what you want to do, there's actually some really interesting things. And the one that I'll, I'll talk through here because it's the one that's easiest to talk about is how you measure sports form in throws. Because unlike other, I mean, I don't know what you think about jiu-jitsu, but in jiu-jitsu, you basically can't, couldn't do a competition every single day, right? You'd be, you'd be dead. In sprint yeah. training, you can't, do, you can't sprint, um, do a sprint race every day because you would pull your hamstring and you'd be in serious trouble. But in throwing, you always measure the distance that you throw. And you can throw every day in training pretty much maximally because it's a one-off explosive movement, just like you can lift weights pretty much close to maximally if you're an Olympic weightlifter every day. So you can actually measure your sports form every day in throwing. And I'm going to show you some examples now of how sports form changes for different athletes in throwing. So this first one here, this is a, a, a high school athlete throwing the 5.5 kilogram shot put in training. And what his coach is doing is that they're starting this, this period of training where they're basically doing the training program like you did every day. And they're measuring how far he's throwing every day. And if we look at the first block of training, you can see he starts off around 14 meters. And each session, they measure the, the furthest throw. So maybe there's 20 throws in the session, and they're measuring the furthest throw, and they're tracking that over time. And you can see how each, over a number of sessions, his form goes up and down. But after about 14 sessions, he reaches a peak. And then they continue, and you see it drops down, and it's just like up and down for a little while. So the coach has looked at that, and he's gone, okay, after 14 sessions, my guy was reaching approximately his best performance for that, that period. So then he took a period of active rest and he came back and he repeated this, a similar training schedule. And again, you see here, the kid is another, it's later in the year, the guy's got better. But again, if you look at how his performance has changed over time, again, this time he reached his peak 16 sessions and it drops off. And then in the third one, you see, again, he's reaching his peak around 14 sessions. So when you have a consistent training program and you're not changing stuff too much, then most athletes have like a, like a, almost like a signature to some extent, a way in which they respond to training and after a certain number of sessions, they start to get into this peak form. And this guy is taking 14 sessions example. Let's switch over and look at another athlete. This girl is a world under 20 champion. Her name is Sophie Hitchin. She actually went on to win a bronze medal at the Olympics later on. But this was this guy, uh, Derek Evely from Evil Track Sports. He actually coached this girl. 
And this is her response to training when she was throwing the four kilogram hammer. And you see here, it takes her 27 sessions to, to get into her peak form. And actually it's quite repeatable for her. And, and they use this throughout their training to make sure that she was ready for the Olympics and the world, the world junior championships and stuff to make sure she performed her best. But look at the difference. The first guy is taking 14 sessions and the second person is taking 29 sessions, almost twice as long to get into what we call their peak form or their, their top sports form. And now imagine that in terms of your preparation for ADCC. If you're the average person, let's say the average person is, is taking 29 sessions, you develop a, a program in which uh, you do 28 sessions over eight week period, then probably you're coming into sports form or the peak form at the ADCC. And maybe 80% of the people that are training with you will also do this. But imagine that you're not that person. Imagine that you are a slow responder who takes 50 sessions. Then you actually might be coming down at the point where you're going to ADCC. And similarly, if you were the shot putter and you took 14 sessions, you're reaching your peak you know, halfway through that eight week camp. And then actually when it comes to your, your big competition, you're not going to do very well. So within a group of people, most people are going to do the same thing, which is why a sports specific training environment where everyone's doing the same thing works for most people. And let's say team sports, for example, would be an example where most people, they, they develop the program for the average person within the team. But if you're a fast responder or you're a slow responder, then that's when problems uh, start to come up. And some of these unique individual athletes, they, they will then need very different training. And often these are the people that get frustrated with a certain camp and then they move training camps and eventually they find someone who's doing a training system that matches with their individual needs. That's not ideally what you want to do as a coach. What you want to do is create a training program that could work for individual people. And this is why tracking sports form could be useful because if you're someone that learns very quickly and can get into sports form very quickly, and let's say you don't need an eight week camp, you only need a four week camp, that has some advantages. One of the advantages being that you could then do multiple cycles in a year and practice going through your preparation multiple times. Maybe they could do twice as many cycles as you do, which means if you're doing three periods in your year, maybe they're doing six. So then technically, theoretically, they have uh, twice the amount of opportunity to improve. Whereas if they're just training in your standardized eight week training program uh, or eight week preparation program, then they're not going to get those learning opportunities. So if you track these things, if you get into that detail, it can be a, a very useful thing uh, to know about. Again, this is a good place to recap on what we've discussed so far. And we start off by talking about the periodization strategy that UFC are promoting as good practice and showed how Lockheed's plan follows a similar structure. During the competition preparation ADCC camp macro cycle, we saw how Lockheed broke the eight weeks down to three mesocycles. The focus for the early camp was on stopping learning new things and instead getting really good at executing what he'd already practiced but under competition intensity. Then during the late camp, which was roughly two weeks from ADCC itself, he turned his attention to making sure he avoided injury by training only with trusted partners and avoiding high-risk scenarios such as posting hard to avoid takedowns. And finally, there was a competition measure cycle, which was the last few days before the camp. And in Lockheed's case, this involved flying to US and recovering, or not in his case, from the jet lag. Having finished talking about the sub-goals for each measure cycle within the ADCC camp or competition preparation macro cycle, we then discussed if eight weeks was a good time frame for such a camp. And here we introduce the concept of sports form and how the number of training sessions needed to reach peak form varies between athletes. While this can be a difficult thing to do, especially in jiu-jitsu, if you figure out uh, if you as an athlete are a fast responder, a slow responder, or an average responder, it can really help to fine tune the planning process. So hopefully you enjoyed the discussion and we'll tune in next time where we will look at the skill development macro cycle before turning our attention to what Lockie was doing on a micro cycle or week to week basis. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below and remember to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you can get notifications whenever Lockie releases new content. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next video.